So at the end of the fine field discrete log lecture, I will summarize the current state of the art as a mostly happy summary of what we've done in the course and saying, well, what we've done in the course is actually really used in practice. But in the same talk, I'd shown you also this uh, table of key size recommendations and was ranting about this last column not being appropriate for long-term security for the public key systems. Now, the reason for that is this paper, or this is one of three papers that Peter Shore has from the 90s to so starting 1994. He published papers showing how to use a large enough quantum computer to, well, the algorithms for quantum computation, discrete logs and factoring. So to break all the public key crypto systems that we have seen so far in this course. So these attacks run in polynomial time on a large quantum computer. That's not good. So it's a very interesting algorithm and I encourage you to look into it and to understand why it breaks all of these methods in one swipe. I mean, what is the similarity of those so that they all fall down? But we're here dealing with the consequences of this. So the first question you might ask yourself, well, um, this is from the 90s. I'm still seeing all of these systems used. So why are we not panicking? And well, there's a fairly recent report from the National Academy of Sciences from the US, which is, um, well, after having interviewed a large number of experts on the state of the art of building quantum computers, progress, expectations, and so on, um, has published a report with 10 key findings. And it's a, it's a pretty voluminous report. So if you click on the URL of this slide, you actually can get to this report. And the key finding one is what I would characterize as don't panic. So the basics saying that the current state of the art in quantum computing and the, the progress in building a quantum computer is not going to go so fast that we're going to see in the next decade a quantum computer big enough to break RSA 2048. Now you might go, well, if it doesn't even break 2048, then I, with my 4,000 something bits key, I'm good for much, much longer. Actually, no. So one problem is that once quantum computers reach that size, afterwards it scales pretty fast. So just scaling up your key size in small steps will not make much of a difference. But okay, they give you from 2019 a decade. But this is just key finding one. There's a lot of key findings in this report on other aspects of quantum. There's key finding 10, which also concerns security and cryptography. And that one I would summarize as panic. So let me read this out in full. Key finding 10. Even if a quantum computer that can decrypt current cryptographic ciphers is more than a decade off, okay, so they're consistent with key finding one, the hazard of such a machine is high enough and the time frame for transitioning to a new security protocol is sufficiently long and uncertain that prioritization of the development, standardization, and deployment of post-quantum cryptography is critical for minimizing the chance of a potential security and privacy disaster. Academics don't take words like a disaster easily. So, well, these people do confirm that it's a real, real problem that all the public key cryptography that we're currently using is based on assumptions that are vulnerable to quantum computers. Now, this paragraph is also laying out a way out of this, namely post-quantum cryptography. So to define this term is post-quantum cryptography is cryptography designed under the assumption that the attacker has a large quantum computer. And I've been bold facing attacker here because the user, well, that's you today. You don't have a quantum computer, but you today need to protect your uh, computations against an attacker who has a quantum computer. Maybe not now, maybe only in the future, but well, I'll motivate the urgency in a moment. So you actually have to do something now. And so the user, we can't assume to have a quantum computer. So we have to design our crypto systems to run on normal, uh, on normal computers, your laptop, your cell phone, well, supercomputing or whatever is necessary, but well, smart cards, for instance, um, but the attacker has a quantum computer. So that's what we study in post-quantum cryptography. Okay, so why does it matter that we actually deal with this now? Well, thanks to the Snowden relations, we actually have pretty clear evidence of one of the big nation states, namely the US, habitually storing data. So, well, X key score you should see on the left here, 
a big map with lots of dots, those are the interception stations. And on the right you see uh, oh, buckyballs. So these are for not internet traffic, but satellite traffic. So basically they're siphoning off all information they can get. Every bit that passes over the internet or through satellites is being ingested by the systems and then analyzed. Now, if you decrypt, uh, if you're encrypting your uh, communication, first of all, thumbs up, you're doing great and you should totally do that. Um, but it's also what is called a selector. So this means it's also something that makes it more likely to be stored. Because, well, they don't know what's in there. Also, they're going to store your plain text communication because, well, they don't know yet why it could be useful. So this is not a reason not to encrypt. And the US is just one of many state actors. And there might be others. There might be just petty criminals or whoever gets access on whatever data will somewhere have a big hard drive or a big building of big hard drives on which they store all the data they want to keep. And then if something, well, they say a decade off, so in 10 years, the adversary has a quantum computer, then many systems or many information, much information is still interesting at that point. So, well, medical records typically have a secrecy period of 40 or 50 years. Um, journalists have sources, security research, well, we have to protect our information, human rights workers in oppressive states. And then it also continues into company secrets, state secrets, and so on. So there are many things which are still interesting in 10 years, 20 years, so the problem is that today, well, you're sending your, your, your system, your messages with our current cryptography using RSA or using loop curves. And of course, I hope you're using loop curves because it's the best we can do right now. But all of those will be broken with a quantum computer. So you're sitting on a time bomb. All the data from today can be decrypted once it has a quantum computer. And so it's very urgent to turn to new systems which can actually protect your information, even once the attacker has a quantum computer. Now this is about confidentiality, so this is about encryption. So with signatures you feel like, hey, well, the signature matters at the moment. If you go into a web page, it's important that at this moment you're being convinced that the web page is authentic, you're getting an operating system update. It matters now that the signature is there. If you believe that now there is no quantum computer, then you can trust the signature and nobody cares about what operating system upgrade you installed in October 2021 once there's a quantum computer in 2030. Um, for something that matters, so if you're thinking about legal documents where you have a last will that you sign and well, you might be not allowed in 10 years, I hope all of you are. Um, another problem is if you think, hey, you can replace them once there's a big quantum computer, then you're assuming that you would somehow be informed of there being a big quantum computer. And yes, academic teams and also to some extent company teams who are building quantum computers are good about keeping the public informed. But there will not be a big announcement if some state actor secretly somewhere builds a quantum computer in their basement. So you then would like to bootstrap somehow from the existing situation you want to upgrade your system. But the problem is that exactly system upgrades is what we're protecting the signatures. And so if at that moment, unbeknownst to you, the adversary has a quantum computer, then you can do all you might with trying to protect your system updates, the signatures. They already can fake signatures. They can already forge uh, a valid looking operating system upgrade. So it's actually important to also think about signatures now. So if you're in any situation where you're doing operating system upgrades, where you're signing releases or such, Consider switching to post quantum signatures. All right, so post quantum encryption, post quantum signatures. Now you really want those things. Well, let me first show you what those systems are based on. Like what I'm going to show you here is the mathematical foundations of these systems. This is not exactly how we use them. This is the hard problem that the attacker has to break. But of course, when you have well, we have seen like all the things that can go on in reality. We have seen with RSA, say the copper smooth attacks, if you have uh, leakage of keys or something. And so also for the systems that are listed here, the concrete implementations can go very wrong. There might be attacks on the implementation. There might be actually um, ways that the systems are 
matched up that is not based on the heart problem. Um, to, to jump ahead a little bit, there is currently a running competition by NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, to select a standard for post quantum cryptography. And when they started the competition back in 2017, they got 69 submissions. And world submissions were open to anybody, and so lots of research, but also some people who are less involved in research in post quantum cryptography submitted systems. And actually, the first system went down within two years hours after the posting, a PhD student of mine uh, wrote a post saying, hey, <laughs> this is actually how you can break this one. Um, and during the last, next few weeks, there was another up to 10 systems that we and others were looking into and were able to break. Even though most of those had some hardness assumption of the basis, they were not actually properly using it. By now, the competition has thinned down a lot. We're now down to 15 submissions, uh, others being well, broken or rejected by NIST as well others are looking more attractive to them. And for those 15, you would be very surprised if there's a gigantic break coming up like this. All right, so what are these systems based on? So there are five main categories, and you can see here the bold face for the names of the categories. And then I've been putting signatures or encryption there because in the post quantum world, some of those systems look better for one or for the others. In particular, hash-based, we can only do signatures. It is a very solid security. All we need is a secure hash function, and we don't even require, say, collision resistance. All we need is pre-image resistance and second pre-image resistance. Well, those are very basic building blocks, and all the signatures you've seen require hash functions anyway. So hash-based signatures are very nice if you want to kind of go with a small base of of things to do. Code-based cryptography, that encryption, um, is looking back to a long history since 1978 of, well, basically no, well, no serious attack and basically no improvements over the attacks. And the benefit of this is that the cipher attacks are really, really short. Um, the hardness is the decoding of error correcting codes, which is also a problem which is well studied, and, well, Coding theory is also being used for normal transmissions, so just normally occurring errors, not just adversarially introduced errors. A downside is that it has very large public keys. So even though it's about as, as old as RSA, we don't see current deployment just because it's a little more inconvenient to use. Or, well, a lot more inconvenient to use depending on your situation. So with RSA, you're looking at a key size of 4,000 bits. Here, you're looking at a key size at a good security level, I mean, at a very conservative security level of one megabyte. And that's cumbersome. Isogeny-based cryptography, um, that's a new, relatively new system, has a shortest history of all these five here. Um, the attractive features are that both keys and ciphertext are short. Well, ciphertext are not as short as code-based, but uh, those are really short. And so with isogeny-based cryptography, it's also nice you seeing a lot of the elliptic curve cryptography that you've learned here uh, pop up again in isogeny-based cryptography. So it's elliptic curves over finite field and then some extra, but it's based on a different problem. So it's not vulnerable to short. Lattice-based is the only one which I put here with encryption and signatures. Um, they're not as small as isogeny-based um, key sizes or ciphertexts, not as small as code-based ciphertexts, but they don't have kind of a very large of anything. So kind of balanced sizes, so both key sizes, signature sizes, and ciphertext sizes are, well, somewhat larger than RSA, but not too terribly so. The security lies on the hardness of finding short vectors, and typically we have some very special lattices. Now, letters you might have heard me say already in context of the LAL algorithm, because that is an algorithm to find short vectors, but actually LAL doesn't find the shortest and doesn't even find vectors short enough to break these lattice-based systems. Or rather, well, all lattice-based systems are scaled up enough so that LAL doesn't affect them. And then finally, multivariate quadratic systems. So you all know linear systems of equations and you know how to solve them efficiently. As soon as you increase the degree of this, so if you're having products of your variables, then those get much, much harder to solve. And so you can build signature schemes on these, which have the benefit of having very short signatures. At the downside of 
large public keys. And then the, the hardness is solving this system of multivariate equations and you typically do well. You're doing this over fine fields, either binary fields or small particles. Now, why can I say that these systems are expected to survive? I mean, we don't have a quantum computer big enough to break RSA. Maybe we're just waiting for a quantum computer big enough to break, say, multivariate cryptography. Now, the thing is, we actually have a good understanding of what a quantum computer can do. We have the axioms, we have the instruction set, basically, what it can do. And so we can build algorithms the same way that Shor built his big algorithm to factor integers and to break discrete logs without having a quantum computer. Similarly, we analyze these systems to how much damage a quantum computer can do. And then the result is, well, quantum computers do speed up the attacks, but it's within a range which we can control. It's sort of similar to how we've seen, say, for elliptic curves, you have attacks that are better than brute force. These are scrolled attacks, so you double your key size. You're using 256-bit keys instead of 128-bit keys. What these uh, post-quantum systems are having are also some form of scrolled attacks and not even on the full size. So typically, if you're scaling up your system, you'll have an easy time outpacing the attack. Okay, so deployment issues and solutions. Why are we not seeing this? Well, we are seeing a little bit of this. So there have been some experiments, and with some of the rollouts, we're seeing those as kind of, well, it won't be worse than RSA if we, sorry, it won't be worse than our current system, ECC or RSA, if we do a hybrid between one post-quantum system and one of these pre-quantum systems. So those are typically using some of the more efficient, um, less well-studied systems because, well, they're convenient to use. And so you say, okay, it's, it's easy to use and, well, we're not doing worse than ECC. So not giving strong guarantees against quantum attackers, but you're giving guarantees against pre-quantum attackers saying, well, it's no worse than that. And it already helps us to understand, hey, is our network going to go down with these keys, which are somewhat larger. The other deployment strategy is to say, well, we want to use only the most conservative systems. For instance, using a combination of MACLEs for encryption and hash-based signatures, so code base for encryption and hash-based signatures for authenticity. And so you want to have that these systems are really, really rock solid because you're in a situation where the data that you're sending really, really cares. And those choices depend on your risk scenario. So the second choice is for, well, you have realized the attacker is storing all the data. The data you're sending now, the data you're encrypting now is really, really relevant and is relevant long term. So in those situations, you will be going for the conservative systems. And in the other case, well, it's your Google searches. You should get privacy for those but it's typically not a huge disaster if something bad happens to it. I mean, until like 10 years ago, we didn't even have encrypted Google searches for most of it. So, hey, it's a nice feature and we can gain some experience. There are some problems because the key sizes are larger. So there's problems with how the internet is being built, what packet sizes are permitted. And well, typically uh, you're allowed to send 1,280 bytes in one session. That is not enough for a MacLeese key. That is not enough for these large megabyte keys. And so, well, it's great for short ciphertext, but it's not great if you have to send your public keys each time. And so Google did some experiments and actually noticed that even this, this limit there is not working. And while there are some protocols to patch packets together, but those relate, uh, got l large delays, didn't always work, and they observed uh, job connections. And there's also some new attacks that we're seeing that are related to, well, some things in, in post-quantum cryptography not being as nice. Those are encryption systems. We don't have anything equivalent to Diffie-Hellman system. And well, we're currently moving towards Diffie-Hellman system because those are really nice and efficient. So we have to, again, redesign all systems. And there's some things like reaction attacks um, that make the deployment a bit more complicated. If you want to play around with it, we have some libraries out. These are good for experiments, not necessarily production quality, but the quality is improving. And Google and Cloudflare have also done some experiments with post one crypto integration into TLS. And so they've been reporting in, again, in this, in this initial category of, well, patching it together with something which probably is okay, 
but it doesn't give you high security guarantees and just to see whether the internet breaks. I mentioned already the NIST competition and so I'm not going to talk much more about it. Actually on the next slide I have a link for the NIST competition so if you want to learn more about what's going on. So they have, well officially it's called a post quantum cryptography project but everybody sees it as a competition and there's currently a rather fierce debate with uh, the candidates starting to pull some hits under the belt line I would say. But anyway, um, so it's an interesting area where you're defining the future of our cryptography and well I'm one of the players, I'm on three of those 15 submissions so I'm certainly watching and taking active part in this. I've also recorded a video lecture course um, on post-quantum cryptography. This is actually running as a part of MathToMath again in spring 2022 so if you uh, like what you've seen here you might want to consider attending that course and then uh, joining me there or if you don't have the time for that well consider watching the videos on the topics that you find interesting. There's a common thread timeline so this is a slightly more recent than the um, report from the National Academy of Sciences that, that I linked where they also have interviews about how soon a quantum computer will be there and what can be expected and then we were in a project uh, which is a new project and we have our expert recommendations and we have lots of software that you can play with. Of course, there are also lots of papers, lots of presentations. If you want to see more of me talking, you can find videos there. If you want to see longer versions of the introduction to post-quantum cryptography, you can get information there. We were in a summer school in 2017. And if you don't just want to see me talk, but other people talk, then please go to the uh, 2017 summer school uh, where we have all the topics covered here, all these five, uh, main areas of post-quantum cryptography, all of those with videos, exercises and slides. And Dan Bernstein and I are maintaining a web page where we're collecting links to the main candidates of post-quantum cryptography. So we're having links to a series of conferences on post-quantum cryptography called the Crypto and we also have bibliographies. Hope you like the area and hope to see you again.